Amen. And good afternoon, everyone. Now I kind of see what um, I was talking at the table. I see what I've been missing being dispersed in Virginia. Around this time, you all are having your um, potluck. I used to be, you know, maybe sitting down having some crackers and some water or something, you know, suffering. But um, this is nice. And this has been, you know, this is really a nice, uh, nice gathering. Excellent food. Linda, I did have your devil days. And they're, they're excellent. Um, it's an honor, and I appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you, uh, Ann, for asking me. Uh, Ann was at the NAACP Elkhart uh, MLK Day celebration when I was the uh, keynote speaker, and I didn't actually see her until the very end. I didn't know that she was there, but when I got up to speak, you know, I saw Laferne there, so I was more concerned about not embarrassing Laferne. <laughs> you know, because she's a star there in the choir and singing, and you know, and then I see Ann, and I would like to, again, congratulate Laferne on her sharing this morning, which was excellent, uh, and appreciated that. But apparently, you know, I did okay, and so Ann asked me to actually share today the similar the message that I shared with the. Uh, NAACP. And so as we celebrate a Black History Month, you know, it's really a time that we set aside to acknowledge, you know, the contributions African Americans have made overall to the American story. And, uh, you know, the other day I heard on the radio someone said, well, if you had White History Month, you know, people would call that racist. And when I heard that, you know, actually, it, it sounds, uh, may sound absurd, but it's really not that absurd of a statement because if you think about it carefully, I was reflecting on in 2007 when I was blessed to be in a stadium recovering the um, uh, nomination of Barack Obama as president. And I was there in 2007 in Denver in the stadium as a journalist. And when you reflect on that, he had two terms in office. So if you're around 15 years old or so, or if you were five or six or something where you can understand kind of what was happening, President Obama is the only president that you've known. So it's not that out of the question to say, why are we having a you know, Black History Month? So some of you probably know and understand that Black History Month is really about celebrating African-American heritage and achievement, but it's really a response to racism. You know, it was actually founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson uh, in response to generations of systemic racism and black achievement and the black story in America essentially being ignored. And so racism, you know, as you know, is essentially a caste system where uh, whites are privileged above all other groups merely because of skin color. So also you probably know that racism in terms of world history is relatively new phenomenon. Uh, it really was, began in the 1500s here in the States when it was put into law uh, as Europeans first had contacts with Native Americans or indigenous people. We know about the doctrine of discovery and how that was usually justified. Uh, those atrocities that happen. Uh, racism is more than bigotry or discrimination. So again, it's relatively new, so that means it wasn't a reality in biblical times. So again, it's not the same as race, uh, uh, bigotry or discrimination. And so it was literally put in the law, and so though racism is no longer legal, it remains uh, systemic. And in America, it's in our DNA. It comes natural to us. So regardless of whether you've had a black president, there will be a need for Black History Month because of its response to racism. And so it's also a historic context that helps us to understand why the Black Lives Matter movement and outrage actually happened during the Obama administration. Because racism is about a group of people actually being considered less than human. And so when we see what happened to uh, 
to Michael in Missouri, uh, Michael Brown, and we understand why the outrage of Black Lives Matter is so important, you have to understand it through the context of black history, through racism in this country. So when people understand this and they see that and why that black body is laid in the street like that, it's because blacks and people are called, considered non-human. So the theme today is steadfast, that I shared at the NAACP, steadfast and immovable. And since we tend to be committed to the things that are most near and dear to our hearts, I'd like you to consider this scripture in Matthew 6.21. For where your treasure is, is where your heart will also be. Where your treasure is, is where your heart will also be. Okay. Now, one thing about this important about black history is that in this particular year, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the key figures in our history that is often referenced. And this year particularly is significant because it's the 50th anniversary of King's assassination on uh, April 4th, 1968. So King's godly mission and words continue to be relevant today. In fact, to read King's words is to wonder if he's speaking not only of the 1950s and 60s, but is he speaking in 2018? Uh, though America has come far in 50 years, as evidenced by President Barack Obama, other changes is dismantling of racism in the law, America is still plagued by the same evils of racism, economic injustice, and militarism that Dr. King had begun emphasizing when his life was snuffed out. And in fact, many believe that King's shift from just civil rights only to connecting the dots of this three-headed monster and its global and domestic impact is what led to the end of his life. But still, King was steadfast and immovable despite knowing the potential cause. Uh, to fully understand this, we must actually go back to April 4, 1967 a year to the day of his assassination. Uh, that day at Riverside Church in New York, Dr. King delivered his most controversial speech called Beyond Vietnam. Anti-war pro-social justice speech was as radical and provocative as his most famous speech, I Have a Dream. During the March on Washington, the I Have a Dream has been made into a uh, nostalgic slogan in a lot of ways but it too was biting and calling out America's injustice to its citizens. For example, in that speech, a lot of people do not realize, because you don't know if it's here this part, King likened the Declaration of Independence and his words, all men are created equal. He likened it to a promissory note or written to the American people, including black people. King said, it is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check and a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. I mean, that's tough language. That's not I have a dream and kumbaya. And actually, the I have a dream part, many of you historians in here will know, that was actually, well, actually, some of you preachers, you know you have like these, these, these uh, sayings and parts in your preach where you just pull out your back pocket and you just throw out, you know, right, Stanley, when you forget something, you just, you go to. I Have a Dream part was actually a speech that he had done at other black churches and was sort of a go-to part, something that he did uh, instinctively, you know, um, that he was called to do. Someone said, tell him about the dream, and he just went into it. But he really came there to talk about this promissory note, you know, marked insufficient funds. So we don't often hear this, again, that it was a central focus of the I Have a Dream speech. And the dream part was actually part of a sermon, you know, that he had done uh, previously at black churches. Many uh, Americans are unaware that the beloved Vietnam speech actually had a Mennonite connection. Did many, any of you were unaware of that? How many knew that, that it had a Mennonite connection? Okay, we got, good, I thought so. We got half the people 
Raise your hands. A lot of Americans don't know that, and we don't even know that ourselves. And that connection was uh, through, uh, was written by a former African-American Mennonite leader, Dr. Vincent Harding, who was a close aide uh, to Dr. King, and his wife, Rosemary Freeney Harding, were strong African-American uh, Mennonite leaders who accepted an invitation from King to move down from Chicago to Atlanta to work in the movement. And they established uh, the Mental House, which is an interracial voluntary service center in Atlanta, down the block from Dr. King and where Coretta Scott King lived in their home. Uh, Vincent and Marie Harding were all in, fully committed, um, steadfast, and immovable. But being steadfast and immovable comes at a great price for Vincent Harding uh, eventually led him to leave the Mennonite church out of frustration. He and his wife, because of the domination's leadership, refused to get fully involved in behind the civil rights movement. So Dr. King asked Harding to write Beyond Vietnam speech because both men, steadfast and immovable, in their commitment to the gospel, their commitment to black liberation, and their commitment to peace and justice for all people. These weren't dreams that you just preached about on Sunday or paid lip service to. Uh, to them, it wasn't just a slogan or what we see today as a hashtag. Uh, being the gospel of Jesus Christ was a daily lifestyle and commitment for them. Beyond Vietnam, Dr. King showed the interconnection of the U.S. foreign policy and military aggression abroad in the name of freedom and justice, and how it suffocated Americans' ability to bring about freedom and justice for all people at home. Dr. King exposed how military spending was starving domestic spending to address the social ills at home. And King spoke out against abuse of the military industrial complex that ironically was a warning that President Eisenhower issued to nation years prior in 1961. Dr. King reasoned that America's apparent addiction to war was corrupting its soul. So here's a quote from the speech. Since I am a preacher by trade, I suppose it is not surprising that I have seven major reasons for bringing Vietnam into the field of my moral vision. There is at the outset a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched the program broken and eviscerated, as if it were some idle political plaything of a, so of a society gone mad on war, and I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in the rehabilitation of its poor, so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men <coughs> skills and money like some demonic destruction, destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. King's words spoken by a Mennonite. Doesn't this sound familiar today? This is an example of where we are in terms of military spending. According to the Washington Post article, fiscal year 2015, the United States military spending totaled about $610 billion. Depending on the source, this is either more than the next 10 or next 14 countries combined. The next closest country is China. Not Russia, it's China. And Russia is at 66 billion. So let me say that again, 610 roughly billion, not million, 610 billion. China is at 100 and something billion. Russia is only at 66. And it's more than the nearest 10 or 14 countries combined. 
American military spending has uh, half of all federal discretionary spending. So think of it this way. You think of your personal budgets, home budget. It would be as if you spend in half your budget on a home security system and, and firearms. Would any of you spend half your budget on a home security system and guns? That's what we're doing as a nation, spending half our budget on military spending. Compare this to 3% on Social Security, 6% on education, 6% on veterans benefits. The very people who are, we say, we celebrate for putting their line, lives on the line. Meanwhile, now President Trump won the campaign to increase military spending, saying that our military has been depleted. Wait a minute. At 600 billion, we're depleted? I mean, 600 billion, we couldn't, we can't do this on 400 billion or 300 billion, we're depleted. And he won on it. Uh, are we insane? And where is the church speaking out on this? You know, our evangelical brothers and sisters are behind Trump and, and they are identified by those who are outside the church as the voice of Christianity. Where are we on this? This is why King's prophetic words remain so relevant today. And here's more of what King had to say back then. Perhaps the more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the, back, the black young men who had been crippled in our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. So we watch them in brutal solidarity, the huts of a, of a poor village, but we realize that they would never live on the same block in Detroit. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. Dr. King's words, spoken, written by a Mennonite. Anabaptists are well known for being pacifists and against military service. In other words, conscientious objectors. However, as an African American who had been denied not just American citizenship, but our humanity, because of our blackness, we know that military service was essential to us fighting for our freedom, our citizenship, our place in America. Like our Native American brothers and sisters and Latinos, we did not have the privilege of whiteness to grant us membership like the immigrants who came from Europe to Ellis Island. We had to fight in every war since the Revolutionary War in order to be seen as God saw us, that is, as human beings, an unalienable right that the American lawmakers ignored. So just look at the movie, for example, Glory. Some of us in an African American community, that scene, if you've seen that movie, where they actually had church before they went to battle. We had church this morning, and they sang this morning like Laferne had us singing this morning before they went to battle, knowing they were able to die. This is probably one of the most sacred scenes in African American culture, because it showed how we had church at that time and the sacrifice that men and women, knowing that they were going to die, went and did it anyway for future generations like us right now. Men and willing, women willingly giving up their lives for generations to come. So likewise, and you see in World War II, Tuskegee Airmen, and World War I, often not talked about the Harlem Hellfighters who helped liberate Europe and one of the most decorated generals came home 
and was killed and was lynched. But equal to that is the fact that likewise, there's great courage and sacrifice in being a conscientious objector. So one of the most notable examples in the um, Anabaptist tradition, some of you know about the Hoffa brothers who are Hutterites during World War I. They were from South Dakota, they were farmers, and they refused to put on a military uniform and fight in the war that was supposed to end all wars, World War I. The two of them died after being transferred to prison at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and even President Woodrow Wilson would later call their treatment savage, barbaric, and medieval. This is how they were hung in, in the, uh, in the um, prison. And one of the things that impressed me so much about these brothers is that they could have actually, they were asked, are you the sole providers of your family? And if they had said yes, they would have been allowed to not have to go to war. And they said no. Why did they say no? So they knew. But they also knew all they had to do was just say, yeah. But they knew that the community would take care of their children. That's steadfast and immovable. And they were tortured as a result. So it takes courage on both, to be both. To go to war, it takes courage. It takes courage not to go to war. Of course, America's probably most famous conscientious objector is an African American. Who's that? Muhammad Ali, right? A member of the Nation of Islam. After being drafted, he refused to go to war, and his famous quote was, I ain't got no quarrel with them being, being calm. <laughs> a Muslim who was not afforded the same leeway as other religious conscientious objectors. Why? Because of the color of his skin, right? So who among us dare say that Ali was not brave? Uh, that Ali was not sacrificing for America? By the time he died, a Muslim was known as one of America's most greatest ambassadors for freedom. You all remember this, right? You remember the image of Ali holding the, at the Olympics and how everybody revered him? Some of you all can remember back in the 60s, how he was one of the most reviled figures in American history. So we often get caught in these circular debates about um, and wanting to condemn the other side of whether you should go to war or not go to war. During Vietnam, some protesters attacked the troops who returned home, calling them baby killers and worse. And if anyone should be condemned, shouldn't it be the world leaders who refuse to resolve uh, disputes diplomatically. Uh, Dr. King was laser focused on being an agent of reconciliation. He was a soldier for peace. He was standing up for our troops, just like the, his speech in 1967. Today, Dr. King would be condemning us, not our servicemen and women, but he would be condemning our leadership. Rather, he would be challenging the government to bring home uh, these committed men and women and challenging the government to do more than just give 6% towards helping them to become home. So you see, King's theology as an African-American Anabaptist uh, is based from the Af African-American tradition was African-American Anabaptism. He's an Anabaptist, essentially. His philosophy is nonviolent, direct social action, racial and economic justice. And so ironically, um, People may not know that Vincent Harding also served in the military. Were well, you all aware of that? Vincent Harding served in the military and was actually in the military where he became a pacifist and realized the, the destruction and, and the, the senselessness of war. According to published reports, um, that's what his experience led him, God led him down the path. This is something that I can understand. Oh, I did not serve in the military. I come from an area of the country in Virginia Beach where there's a high military population. You all know my church, Calvary Community Church in Hampton. Virginia has many people who served in the military. Families have been affected, uh, people in the military. And it's well known that Glenn Guyton, 
now new ex uh, incoming executive directors from Calvary, and left the military a successful career out of his uh, convictions. Not condemning people in the military, but out of his convictions. I interview many people as a journalist, whether on my radio show as a columnist, who families in the military, people personally had the experience. And I can tell you that as the people in the military who know best about why we should not be at war and the cost of going to war, and a lot of them are the least ones that want to go to war. So condemning them for that service is really uh, useless. Again, African Americans, Native Americans, Latinos, people of color know best about serving in the military than coming home and still not being able to enjoy full citizenship. There's a movie out now called The Post. Some of you have seen that about the Pentagon Papers. This is a study that was prepared by the uh, Defense Department showing that going back to the Eisenhower administration, how the U.S. government lied about Vietnam. Uh, isn't this still the case today? Here's something to ponder. The U.S. has only been at peace for 21 years out of its entire time we've been a nation. The U.S. has never gone a decade without a war. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, right? We're supposed to be a Christian nation, right? How are we a Christian nation? Why would we even want to say we're a Christian nation? Uh, King was prophetic in exposing America's moral dilemma. Generations later, we are living that result today. Mass incarceration, steady rise in unaffordable housing. America spends more on health care than anybody else, and we got the poorest health care, growing economic inequality. All because we spend half of our personal budgets on home securities and guns. And no, food, no money for food, no money for clothing. It's insane. All of this because our priorities as a nation are deeply flawed. So in the Bible it says, Matthew 6 and 21, for where your treasure is, where your heart will be also. We're coming up on tax season. Right? My tax accountant is a funny guy. <laughs> he always says, if you want to know, truly know something about somebody, don't ask their preacher. Don't ask their spouse. Ask their tax accountant. Because where you spend your money is what you, is what you value. So according to 2015 Global Peace Index, America is not among the 10 most peaceful nations in the world. Does anybody know what the number one nation is? Peaceful nation. Iceland. Iceland, who know that? My God, wow. <laughs> Somebody stole my notes. <laughs> that resident, Iceland. Iceland is nowhere near the highest military spender. Canada is actually pretty close at number seven. But guess what? Canada got bullied by President Trump, and now they're talking about raising their military budget 70%. Can you buy peace by investing in war? It doesn't seem that way. Is war truly where America's heart is, or is it peace? I, I, think, the, I think the answer is obvious. So this is what King was wrestling with, with these questions. He was steadfast and immovable in his position as a minister of the gospel. But what about us? What about us? Are we steadfast and immovable in this situation we find ourselves in? Today, as we look around, we see violence and war in our communities. Just yesterday, there was yet another mass shooting at a high school in Florida, at least 17 lives gone, gun violence. Whether it's here or in Elkhart or in Chicago or the Congo or Syria or Israeli pa Israel, Palestine, we must not become disheartened and discouraged though. We are part of an ongoing spiritual struggle for the heart and soul of humanity. And we must realize that we are all responsible to do our part. So it's in this work at Mennonite Mission Network, or whether it's with our churches or wherever we live individually, uh, we need to make an effort to be steadfast and immovable in making a better community 
a better lives for everyone. How are we responding to injustice when we see it? How has this uh, shaped your perspective you know, on racism? As I conclude, I recently interviewed um, Dr. Rachel Harding. That's uh, Vincent's and Rosemary's daughter. I interviewed her recently for a radio show. And she's also a historian and a professor at the University of Colorado in Denver. And she's carrying on the work of her parents through the um, Aikida Center for Peace, Learning, and Dialogue. And she's also an activist in her own right. And she told me that regarding the split of her parents from the church, that she really only until recently understood the death of what actually happened and their frustration, because they never really talked about it. They didn't dwell on it. And all the time while she was growing up as a child, she really didn't see their pain. What she did see was her parents had maintained loving relationships with Mennonite friends, men and women, who were steadfast and immovable in their love for each other. She told me this, I quote, Titus Bender, who many of you probably know, was an amazing, committed white Mennonite minister. Al and Ann Zook, uh, who my parents actually lived with for a while, there was some really very dedicated white Christians in the Mennonite faith who I simply knew as my parents' dear friends. And one of the things that the Harding stress is that, particularly to students at the university, is that there has always been, throughout America's history, people who have been steadfast and immovable and deadly committed to peace, justice, righteousness for all people, regardless of what was popular at the time. So we know during slavery, you had the abolitionists. And so they emphasize that they try to encourage people to be encouraged by those people who stood their ground even when it wasn't popular. And so Dr. King didn't just dream. He modeled a steadfast and immovable life that we can choose to follow today. We shouldn't just romanticize about King's dream, but follow his example as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. In closing, I'll let you hear from the words of Dr. Vincent Harding, another true disciple, uh, talking about his dear friend. And this is what he said about King. Men do not get assassinated for wanting children of different colors to hold hands on a mountainside. Dr. King was telling us to march on segregated housing, segregated schools, poverty, a military with more support than social programs. That's where Dr. King was even in 1965. The 1963 I Have a Dream speech, we idolized that. But like I shared, he was already there. And by 1965, he was well on his way. And by 1967, he made the speech. If we let him go where he was going, then he becomes a challenge, not a comfort. There's a lesson for us. If we lock up Martin Luther King, and make him unavailable for where we are now so we can keep ourselves comfortably distant from the realities he was trying to grapple with, we waste King. All of us are being called beyond those comfortable places where it's easy to be a Christian. That's the key for the 21st century, to answer the voice within us as it was with Martin, which says, do something for somebody. We can learn to play on locked pianos and to dream of worlds that do not yet exist. So the challenge for us is what are we going to do in this time of craziness and madness that King and Harding prophesied about? Right, thank you. Thank you.